In the sci-fi comedy Galaxy Quest, there's a scene where a human pretending to be an alien is horrified by the food his species is supposed to like. While the scene is played for laughs, it's interesting to think about the strange little details of alien daily life that most stories don't include. Enter the Berg Project, a world-building series that brings to life an expansive alien ecosystem, but also delves into the most minute cultural details of its central intelligence species. Created by the brilliant artist Ripley, the Berg Project doesn't just explore the biology of its titular aliens, but also imagines how they put on clothes, how they play the horn, even how they sneeze. So, for this entry into the archive, we'll explore the incredible world of the Bergs. And as usual, you can follow the artist on social media and see more of her project using the links in the description. Now, let's explore this alien planet on both a macro and micro scale. We'll start with the Bergs themselves. Also called bird bugs, these extraterrestrials superficially resemble a cross between Earth birds and Earth bugs, and have developed a level of intelligence similar to our own. The planet they evolved on is a habitable world with extreme seasonal variations, meaning the bergs must hibernate for much of the year. Internally, berg bones don't all connect the way ours do. As the ancestor of most land animals on their planet had an exoskeleton like Earth insects. In the eons since, bergs and their kin have convergently developed vertebrae to support their necks, but their ribs are still free floating. Berg mouths are made of two nimble pinchers that can move independently, as this biomechanical visualization illustrates. This means that berg jaws function more like the mouth parts of Earth spiders than of vertebrates. Another visualization of berg biomechanics shows us how the creatures breathe. They take in oxygen through apertures near their eyes, which in turn lead to lungs located in their neck, and then they exhale from exhaust apertures on their sides. And as mentioned before, here's how a berg sneezes. Like humans, bergs have a range of facial expressions they use to communicate emotion. To our eyes, these expressions might be hard to read, but to bergs, these emotive displays are just as intricate as our own, with mandibles, eyes, and antennae position coming into play. You may have already noticed that most bergs possess fine hairs over much of their bodies, which helps them keep warm during the long winter months of their homeworld. Much of the berg's rounded shape actually comes from this fluff, and without it they appear like withered, skeletal lifeforms. Because of their fur, clothing isn't the same kind of cultural requirement it is in most human societies, yet many bergs still wear garments to further shield themselves from the elements, show off their wealth, or denote their nationality, for berg societies are just as complex as our own. And like humans, Berg civilization has been shaped in no small part by the numerous other species on their planet. Trunk horses are among the most invaluable species to Berg society, serving as both steeds and guardians of Berg children. This mare keeps a watchful eye on her foals as she grazes, and while one of her foals looks different from the others, she guards it just as fiercely. Another steadfast companion of the Bergs are the Jaubja, dog-like creatures that have been at the Berg's side since the dawn of their civilization. Like Earth dogs, many breeds of Jaubja exist, with most acting as pest control and highly territorial guardians of farmland. Like cats, Jaubja are largely self-domesticated, meaning they chose to integrate with Berg society as a survival strategy. And bergs keep other types of pets as well. Here, a child proudly displays their prized scale bugs. These colorful creatures spend their larval stage in the bark of certain trees, where they are collected by local kids and raised to their adult stage. These vibrant pets are considered fashionable and function almost like living jewelry. Bergs also cultivate insects called pottery bees in large farms. 
The bees themselves are rarely consumed, but a fungus that the bees grow for food is considered a regional delicacy. Populations are carefully maintained by local keepers, protecting the large mud nests with fences and moats. It is custom for pottery bee keepers to leave a small token as payment for the harvested product. On farms, the larger bumblebird classification of insects plays key roles as pollinators. Many plants have co-evolved pits full of sugary reservoirs to lure in bumblebirds, who then spread their pollen to other plants, a convergent relationship to that of flowers and earth bumblebees. Most insects on the bird planet are covered in scales, which have developed into protective exoskeletons in some clades. Many flying clades of insects lay their larvae within specific crops, and sometimes play a vital role in the life cycle of the plants. These strange parasites are a hugely important resource to the bergs both as pollinators and as food, and are also consumed for their mind-altering properties. For bergs who live on the coasts, most of their food comes not from the land, but from the sea. Coastal bergs partake in a wide variety of seafood fresh from the planet's bountiful oceans. Fish within the waters of the berg homeworld take on a variety of curious and startling forms, with most possessing the multi-part mouths common throughout most lineages on the planet. Some of the largest creatures in the ocean are filter feeders with specialized mouths that funnel zooplankton into baleen-like structures on their jowls. While these creatures might not look it, they share a common ancestor with the dog-like jalbja that the bergs keep as pets. Elsewhere on the coast, there's also a species of crab-like lifeforms, which is good because all speculative settings should have some form of crab. Further inland, the flag deer family sports some of the tallest creatures found on Berg World. These towering lifeforms are related to the trunk horses, although their trunks have become lengthy, flagpole-like appendages used to reach leaves on the tops of trees, much like the long necks of earth giraffes. On the opposite end of the spectrum, snuffling around the bottoms of trees are pig-like armored herbivores that feed on bark and roots. Their sharp mandibles can inflict serious harm on would-be predators, so most creatures keep their distance. The tree-like plants of the Berg planet are quite different from trees here on Earth. Sun spires are towering plants with leaves that grow in tightly clustered chambers like giant compound eyes. These lenses act like a magnifying glass, helping to optimize photosynthesis, and the Bergs once used them to make decorative windows, sun catchers, and even primitive spectacles and telescopes. Today, sun spire lenses are more commonly formed to make distinctive jewelry. A ubiquitous group of trees are the feather veins, plants that are named for their feather-like assemblage of leaves. Though equivalent to earth trees in certain ways, feather veins diverge in their production of walking seeds, a mobile stage of their reproductive cycle that can amble along in search of ideal land in which to begin the more familiar plant stage of their life cycle. Different walking seeds have different specializations, and most briefly fill an insect-like niche within their ecosystem. In silica-rich soils, landscapes of coiling vines dominate the scenery. These mounds take thousands of years to reach their current size, with successive layers of vines growing on top of the old ones in a reef-like fashion. And like marine reefs, they support a diverse assemblage of life including local bergs that hunt for small game. Yet bergs aren't always the ones doing the hunting. Many bergs are still very much in the middle of a larger food web. And there are various apex predator species that can turn a berg into their lunch, especially during the planet's long winters when bergs need to hibernate. And there is no deadlier predator of the hibernation period than the omb. 
The source of the Berg's darkest legends, these beasts have sensitive mechanoreceptors on their legs that allows them to locate burrows hidden underground. The Ohm's habit of exhuming hibernating animals has inspired countless horror stories of Berg homes being torn into in the dead of night. For even at mid-latitudes, Berg world winters are easily as cold, dark, and vicious as those seen in the far polar regions of Earth. Nothing roams these snows save the lumbering beasts that prey upon the bones of the dead as readily as they rest sleeping creatures from their hidden burrows. Aesthetically and thematically, the Berg Project takes inspiration from the 1984 Hayao Miyazaki film Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Based on a manga of the same name, the film tells the story of a post-apocalyptic Earth with a toxic ecosystem, where the last humans struggle to coexist with giant insects. The visual parallels between the surreal, insect-dominated ecosystems of Nausicaa and the Berg Project are evocative. During the early stages of production, director Miyazaki created several watercolor paintings to help decide the look of his futuristic biosphere. And these early storyboards in particular echo through the style of the Berg planet. In different ways, both stories explore themes of conflict between society and nature. Again and again in Nausicaa, humans are reminded that the Earth is something beyond their control, and trying to resist this only ends in self-destruction. Likewise, for all their intelligence, the Bergs don't have dominion over their unforgiving planet. They are just a single thread in a larger ecological tapestry, with all aspects of their culture shaped by their environment. Yet different Berg civilizations have different relationships with nature, as Berg cultures are as rich and varied as our own. One of the most influential groups are the Tuwi, Bergs who control a vast empire of interconnected cities. Cultures across the Tui Kingdom are endlessly complex, with an emphasis on folklore and ceremonial formalities. When a Tui dies, family members carry the body to a special room, where it naturally mummifies, and they keep it in there for a year-long grieving period. The body is then cremated and spread to the wind, with any remaining ashes mixed into the clay of a little sculpture made to resemble the departed loved one. Most Tui buildings are wattle and daub, made from the gray-bluish wood of feather vein trees and bundles of fibrous grass stuffed into the walls for insulation. For food, one of the key staple crops in the Tui Empire are a tuber-like fungus that act as roots to the feather vein trees. With their agriculture and city building, the Tui are quite different from most nomadic bird cultures. Yet Tui still engage in many traditional bird practices, like the grooming of each other's fuzz to remove dirt and unwanted parasites. This social grooming behavior is not unlike that of certain Earth primates, and is a way for the birds to deepen their social bonds. Some of the most esteemed community members are Moon Watchers, shamans who forgo winter hibernation in order to guard their sleeping communities from the physical and spiritual horrors of the long cold night. For even in the Tui Empire, bergs are never fully separate from nature. Of course, Tui aren't the only bergs with distinct cultures. Some berg societies practice scarification, using scarring techniques to create cosmetic patterns in their fuzz growth. And most Berg societies have their own form of music, like these ceremonial horns designed to resemble the mouths of trunk horses. Due to Berg's unique biology, the mouthpieces cover their exhaust spherules. Unique instruments present in the Tui Empire are standing devices functionally similar to the accordion, with bellows pumped by the medial arms while the anterior hands press the keys. Nearly all Berg societies engage in, a uh, chemical recreation, which can range from grub fruits, which have perception-altering effects on Bergs, to the shaved bark of certain plants, which relaxes their mind and body. In bird culture, these stimulants play an important role in social bonding, 
and are expected at most gatherings. One of the weirder forms of recreation the birds have involves slumber bugs, scorpion-like creatures that produce venom which medics have historically used as painkillers. However, some birds use them less responsibly, which over centuries has led to various breeds with creative names and variations in potency. While not outlawed, slumber bug use is widely seen as a bad idea. Like many ancient and modern human cultures, birds have created a wide array of mobility aids. Canes and crutches come in a few different forms, with their shape depending on which bird limb needs the most support. In the windy equatorial region, strange statues suggest bird civilization has a long history. The singing giants, mysterious statues that make an eerie whistling noise when the wind blows through the holes in their heads, lie scattered on the plains. Their original purpose is unknown, but the local nomads believe their humming are the voices of passing ghosts. Much of Berg religion is tied to seasonal changes in environmental forces. Some communities participate in ritualistic brush burning, removing dead grasses so new ones can spring up. At seasonal festivals, Bergs who wish to show off don flashy costumes and circle around each other in a mock battle. Referees judge participants in these dancing rituals on their synchronicity and how close they stay to their partner without touching them. And like all known human cultures, Berg societies have legends of monsters, one of which this folk costume is meant to depict. As on Earth, most of these mythical beings do not actually exist. But perhaps some do. A widespread legend among Bergs tells of an eerie creature, something like a great worm with many legs that stalks the thickets at night. Some say they come from the underworld, or perhaps they are mischievous spirits of the wild. But in truth, these secretive nocturnal life forms are called millipedes, a highly intelligent species that quietly coexist with the bergs in the remote corners of the planet. Their exact intelligence is difficult to measure. Perhaps they are as smart as dolphins, or perhaps they are just as intelligent as the bergs themselves. In any case, these wise, elusive beings have stayed hidden from the bergs for untold generations by retreating into huge dirt mounds during the day. Perhaps one day, as empires like the Tui continue to expand, a fateful meeting will finally occur. Some of the most interesting pieces from the Berg project depict the experiences of the Tui and other groups on the edge of the frontier. They show an almost mythic landscape of discovery and danger. Aesthetically, these works take inspiration from a very unexpected source for a work of speculative biology, the cinematic language of westerns. One of the largest genres of film for over half a century, Classical westerns told stories of exaggerated heroism in a mythical golden age of freedom. In the modern era, however, so-called neo-westerns have sought to reevaluate the folk stories of the Old West, examining the era under a more self-aware and critical lens. While thematically the Berg Project strongly echoes the latter, aesthetically many pieces play clever homage to old-school pulp westerns taking the iconography of gunslingers, horses, and outlaws and translating them into a new dialect of alien imagery. For example, one image translates the classic trope of a cattle herder into something decidedly unique. Here, we see a shepherd on a trunk horse watching over their livestock. These animals themselves aren't valuable, but instead serve as hosts to a sort of tick that is sold as a delicacy in Tui cities. On a dusty street corner in a city, an old herder idles away in the afternoon sun. Far from a heroic folktale, life in these settlements is often tough and short. In the Tui borderlands, a proud captain bears a flag of her modest gang. Rear-end adornments are ubiquitous in Tui society, but flags are more formal, used to identify important members in war parties and to distinguish friend from foe. Tui who venture beyond city limits must come prepared. 
Headgear for shielding the eyes and saddles adorned with packets for carrying personal items are key. It is also common to wear underclothes to stay protected from the wind and dust. This particular bird doing the modeling is named Swoos, and she is something of a protagonist in this strange neo-western mythos. In one of the most expressive pieces, Swoos races through the canyon lands, having drawn the ire of a large aerial predator. While she still has her firearm, it's not doing her much good. Like most neo-western protagonists, Swoos experiences more misfortune on the frontier than dazzling heroics. More broadly, this section of the Berg project echoes the neo-western motifs of ordinary people trying to live ordinary lives yet struggling to survive. It seems fitting that a project with an emphasis on minute details would take inspiration from a genre built on stories of the ordinary. Yet the Berg project is too unique to be pinned down to any single genre. The artist states that they feel the project has expanded beyond its western roots, and has become a broader exploration of how people interact with and are shaped culturally by their environments. Even if, in this case, the people are six-limbed aliens. If you find this project as fascinating as I do, you can support the artist on social media and see more of the Bergs using the links in the description. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.